Well, mostly what we do is um, solar energy education in schools. And um, so over the past couple of years, it's been a, a lot of work on climate resolutions at school districts. And then figuring out, well, how does that translate into the classroom? So there's a lot of work going on with along those lines. And then uh, about, let's say about a year and a half ago, we, you know, we learned of this book called Drawdown. And saw Paul Hawken talk over in Hillsburg. Some of you might have been there. Um, and it was really sort of an eye-opener for me that has been sort of focusing on solar energy as a, as a solution to, you know, shaping a clean energy future. That really there's a whole bunch of solutions that um, we can all, you know, adopt and support and tackle as far as shaping the future. So, um, and then we've gone to a couple climate talks and, and locally here in Sebastopol, there's a group called Sebastopol Climate Action that, that just got started. We'll pass around a sign up for that if you want to learn more. Um, just with the idea that what can we do? What can we do, each, each of us, uh, on small, medium, and large levels? And, you know, it's, so, so then this idea of a Sebastopol Carbon Conversations about and the idea that we're pursuing is that we'll use drawdown as sort of the framework and the idea of a reference for exploring many of these solutions that are highlighted and uh, drilling down into those in the coming year so over the course of, there will be a couple more talks this later this fall and then also uh, from January to June, we'll dig into things like regenerative agriculture and electric transportation and so forth. But the, um, the idea of a conversation is really sort of evolving, like how do, how do we work this? But uh, I think the idea is, is sort of to tease out what can, what can I do, what can we do individually, together, uh, and despite our busy lives, etc. So that's what we're kind of going for. But I wanted, at this point, to introduce Crystal Chazelle. She's from uh, the organization Project Drawdown and in, uh, near San Francisco. And she's going to share with us uh, an introduction to the Project Drawdown. And, uh, and then we'll have, we'll, she'll present, and then we'll have a, a Q&A session after that. And I'm actually just curious, um, how many of you have not been to a climate talk before? You mean any kind? Yeah, of any kind. Oh, there's a few. Okay, so um, a lot of a lot of energy, a lot of knowledge here. So I'm going to turn it over to you, and maybe we'll adjust this. Hi, thank you so much for coming out. My name is Crystal Chiselle, and I'm Vice President of Operations and Engagement at Project Drawdown. So today I'm going to give an overview of Project Drawdown and the work we've done, um, show you some of the solutions that um, our work describes, and also um, mainly focus on how our work has been taken up in, uh, around the world since this series is focused on action. Um, so Project Drawdown is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 2014 in Sausalito. We've now gone to a remote um, work situation, so we don't have a location. We're just now a global organization. So we define drawdown as the point when levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere stop climbing and then steadily decline, ultimately reversing global warming. And actually, Project Drawdown 
coined this meaning of the term drawdown, and have, we've been doing our best to spread it around the world and have everyone use it. One of our goals is to have drawdown be the goal for humanity. So instead of <laughs> mitigating climate change or reducing the, slowing the rise of greenhouse gases, we think that the goal for humanity should be drawdown, the point where greenhouse gases begin to decline. We also have set out to change the worldwide conversation around global warming and climate change. Um, from a conversation of despair and um, hopelessness to one of possibility and opportunity. And so to do that, we're focusing on solutions instead of um, just a recap of the problem of global warming. So if you come to us, we're not going to spend a lot of time convincing anyone that global warming exists because we think it's more important to focus on solutions. And we've also, uh, the meat of our work is to determine whether drawdown is possible. And so to do that, we embarked on a global research project, an ongoing research project to scan the academic literature worldwide, data sets worldwide, to determine what are the most effective existing solutions, those that are already proven, already um, in existence and scaling around the world, and also those for which there's enough data currently available to create mathematical models to demonstrate their potential to reduce greenhouse gases in the atmosphere over the next 30 years. Now, these are photos of some of the 75 researchers from around the world that we gathered to do this global research project that started, um, really got underway in 2015. Um, the researchers we've brought together to date are from six continents, 22 countries, and about half of them are women. So the solutions that um, were modeled in our work are of two categories. Those that reduce the amount of greenhouse gases going up into the atmosphere, either by more efficient technologies or um, by reducing the amount of emissions, as well as those that draw carbon back down to earth through um, biosequestration and carbon sinks. The solutions are a broad range of solutions across several categories. So some of the commonly um, thought of categories of solutions that we looked at include electricity generation, buildings, transportation, and materials. But what distinguished our work was that we also added in other sectors that are not commonly, or at least at the time, had not been commonly thought of when thinking about solutions to uh, the climate crisis. So we looked at solutions in the food system, land use solutions, gender equity, and as of um, this year, we began research um, on ocean solutions. So I want to scan through some of the solutions. Um, ordinarily, I might talk about in detail more about the solutions, but um, since we want to focus more on action, I'll spend my time, most of my time there. But I do want to scan through so that you can get a, an idea of the broad range of solutions that are included in this research and modeling. So um, refrigerant management, which our modeling showed is the most effective um, solution at this time. Electric bikes. Family planning. Forest protection. Regenerative agriculture. Educating girls. Telepresence. Rooftop solar, improved rice cultivation, 
reduced food waste. Silva pasture. What does that mean? So silva, silva pasture is the practice of having <coughs> trees planted in grazing land. So grazing land that, um, that includes trees sequesters significantly more carbon than it does um, land without trees. Clean cook stoves. Indigenous people's forest management. So there's a lot more information. You can dig into any of the solutions and information about them and what they mean at our website. So I don't, but I'm, I'm also happy to answer questions about them as well. I wanted to show you um, the ranking of the top 20. This ranking is a, a ranking of potential to reduce greenhouse gases in the atmosphere over a, over a course of 20, uh, 30 year period. Can everyone see that? It's possible to get that in some other fashion than taking a picture of it. Um, sure, yeah. Um, you can see it at drawdown.org. <laughs> um, and you can see the ranking of all 80 solutions that are included. So our, our work um, and the book Drawdown that we published includes 80 solutions for which modeling was done, so statistical analysis of their potential to reduce greenhouse gases, as well as a, a financial analysis. Um, and, and the book also includes 20 what we call coming attractions, which are solutions for, that are still nascent or still on the horizon, but that have a potential if they come online to get us to draw down faster. Now, what I wanted, uh, many insights came out of this work, but one insight that I think is really important is, is this, that 12 of the top 20 solutions are related to the food system and land use. So you, you might automatically think that we are reliant on some technology to get us to draw down, that that's the most important thing, that we need to invent a new technology or develop technologies that we already have in existence. But really, it's that we need to work in better cooperation with Earth. Now this is a pie chart that's showing all of the 80 solutions. What's important about this is that these solutions work as a system. And this is how the analysis was done by our researchers. When they did the modeling and integrated all of the calculations as far as the effectiveness of this, the solutions, they looked at it as an entire system. So we can't be fooled into thinking that only the top 20 solutions, we only need to focus on those and we'll get to draw down. We, all the solutions are important, none are less important than any others, and it really works as a system. Now this is the cover of Drawdown, um, the book that we published in 2017. The subtitle is The Most Comprehensive Plan Ever Proposed to Reverse Global Warming. That's a pretty big statement, right? Sounds kind of arrogant. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a bold statement. Um, at the time, there had we were not aware of any plan that had been proposed to re reverse global warming. <laughs> so we're on pretty safe ground to say that. <laughs> One thing I want to point out is that if you look at these the solutions in Drawdown as a whole, it is a very comprehensive plan. But I, I want to point out some things that were not included, that if we're going to look at an extremely comprehensive plan, things that we really need to consider that aren't necessarily featured or called out, they, may be, they are mentioned in the book Drawdown, but that I think are really important for us to consider if we're thinking about an extremely comprehensive plan. And here are a few examples. So we didn't model reduced consumption. So we only modeled um, solutions where there were data sets available and, and defined, so there were 
parameters around this research because the idea was to get it done in a two-year period. And it actually took three years. So um, we couldn't look at every, um, every solution on the planet and it was limited to solutions that where their data sets were available. And so there had to be parameters around what could be considered. But we really are going to have a hard time reaching drawdown if we don't consider our consumption and reducing um, what we do, especially in the United States. Another example, peace. We have to consider the cost of our um, military approach and the cost of war, the cost to the planet. But peace is a very difficult solution to model. <laughs> and another thing that's really important to consider um, in, a, in a very comprehensive plan is equity and a just transition. So if we go about these solutions in a way that um, continues to damage the health of certain people or ignores the needs of certain people or unemploys certain people and we don't benefit everyone as we go along, then we don't have a really good comprehensive plan. So I want to tell you about some things that have resulted since 2017 when we released this initial research. So we knew that a small organization, albeit with a global team, we do have a global team of researchers, but a small organization based in Northern California was not going to be able to tell the rest of the world how to solve global, global warming. We knew that we would need to expand this research, we need to bring on partners, and so our vision was to have, as, have this research and modeling um, spread around the world. And so we've been working very hard to bring on other research institutions to partner with us in this work. And we have partnered with Penn State University to um, help expand this work. And they have um, about 40 of their faculty who have, are, are committed to this. And also they held a, um, a, a drawdown scholars program this past summer where they brought um, recruited undergraduate students from around the country to come and help work on this research. And later this month they will be hosting the first <coughs> annual drawdown research conference at Penn State, Research to Action. Researchers will be coming from around the country and around the world to talk about the, the um, analysis that Project Drawdown did and how to um, improve upon it. Um, also, um, we're looking for other organizations or replicas of Project Drawdown to form. So the idea is to um, form a global collaboration of research associations. And Drawdown, the Drawdown Europe Research Association is the first research association to come on board in that model. And they will be doing a replica of what Project Drawdown did for the European context. Have you thought to live stream this? It will be live, live streamed. Yes, that will be announced this week. So you'll be able to find that information on our website. Um, this is an example of a business that took Project Drawdown's analysis and used it. We, we didn't even know they were doing this, um, but it's cooleffect.org. And what they do is offer offsets, carbon offsets, and they found projects um, around the world um, that sequester carbon, and they tied them to the Drawdown solutions. So when you go through their website looking for an offset and choose a, uh, one of their projects, you'll also see which drawdown solution it's related to. The Drawdown Eco Challenge has been a really effective tool. I don't know if any of you have know about it or participated in it. Um, it's, it's, it's global um, and it's an opportunity to participate in a challenge where you can join a team or participate on your own and for 30 days you choose actions to complete 
and, and earn points. And so that's been a very, very popular, especially with students. Um, and for the past two years, it's been a month-long challenge in April of each of those years. But later this fall, they will be launching it as a year-round eco-challenge so that you can um, sign up to complete it at any time of year. Now, this is, I wanted to show you this because um, after the first Drawdown Eco Challenge, which was the winning team was a high school team from North Carolina, and the teacher who um, was the advisor for that team thought it was so successful and so engaging for the students that she held a, um, a Drawdown Summit for high school students um, last summer. Before the summit, she polled the students about their attitudes and how does climate change make you feel. And you can see on the left some of their responses. I just feel disappointed um, in what has made this a possibility. It just, it makes my head hurt. It gives me stress and anxiety. It brings up a feeling of use, uselessness. I feel scared in the back, back of my throat. I want to cry. Then after the weekend summit, where they learned about drawdown and all of the broad range of solutions that are already proven to be effective, they had these reactions. I feel motivated and excited. Awesome. I'm so stoked to get home and share everything I've learned. Facilitating inspiring rather than aggressive conversations. I feel energized and engaged and a lot more hopeful. I can teach people in my community and initiate change with the people around me. So there really is some value in focusing on solutions. <laughs> this is an example of a company that decided to use draw, the book Drawdown as a team building exercise. So they bought a copy of the book for every staff member and they used it as a book club and had discussion groups around it. As a result, they were so inspired that they decided to take five of the, five of the solutions and focus more deeply on them and um, create an ongoing um, action plan to implement the solutions that they, that they found the most engaging. Now, this is one of my favorite examples. Um, there's a... a man in Bamenda, Cameroon, who contacted me through our website, who was interested in Drawdown. And I sent him some of our Drawdown posters. And since then, um, in 2017, he's recruited a team of volunteers, and he's gone all around the Bamenda area in both the um, urban and the rural areas to educate people about drawdown and drawdown solutions. And he told me he estimates he's engaged with, a, and he and his team have engaged with about 10,000 people about drawdown solutions. He says um, agriculture employs 70% of the citizens in Cameroon. So they're very alarmed about deforestation. Girls' education rates are poor, and there are high birth rates. So the solutions that appeal to them most are, because I wanted to know, what is it about this work that appeals to you? How is it getting so much um, attention and how are you engaging so much with it? He says that they, the, the solutions that appeal to them are afforestation, forest protection, regenerative farming, reducing food waste, and girls' education, because these really have a direct impact on their lives. I also um, sponsored, um, I was contacted by another person in Zimbabwe and sponsored his booth. He wanted to have a climate um, change booth at the Zimbabwe International Book Fair. And so he spoke with about 1,300 people at that fair. And this is a photo of some of the children at the fair, school children at the fair. So he told me that People there are very are now very convinced about um, 
global warming because of Cyclone E-Day, which happened um, back in March. So that direct effect on them has them very interested in solutions. Now, um, Zimbabwe is one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, the people believe, he said that most people believe that only the developed world has the capacity to address climate change. But he also shared with me the solutions that people there are already implementing. Reduced food waste, plant-rich diet, educating girls, family planning, rooftop solar, regenerative agriculture, afforestation, conservation agriculture, clean cook stoves, LED lighting, water saving in the home, and household recycling. So in one of the poorest countries in the world, people are implementing a host of climate solutions. And these are the people who have contributed least to global warming. So I use this as an example to remind me to keep it all in perspective when I get tired or I don't want to reduce my emissions <laughs> or, you know, or where I find it difficult to um, change my behaviors. I just keep it in perspective by reminding me that there are people who are feeling the effects more than us, who have contributed less than us, but are still engaged in solutions. So I want to, um, so I want to give you several um, ideas for steps you can take. Tord asked me um, if I could suggest small things, medium-sized things, and large things. <laughs> so. Um, one thing I suggest is visit drawdown.org and learn about so, solution, the full range of solutions that we have modeled there if, in case you're interested because I really think that being informed about solutions is a huge important step so that we're not bamboozled by the news coverage and we know that there are effective solutions already scaling and that we can plug into. Um, some of them do lend well to individual action, but some of them don't. Um, some of them have to be done um, on a larger scale or at the federal level or the nation state level. I think another thing that's important to do is be willing to change your behavior and change your attitudes because it's so easy to be discouraged with what we hear day to day. So I think that's a really important thing to do is to get a hold of your mind. <laughs> and then I think, um, I think that, so I think that another thing that's really Im very important is that you decide how you're gonna work with others. So on a small scale, a medium scale, and a large scale. So like, is there one other person that you're gonna work together with to keep you inspired? <laughs> and keep you, um, you know, wanting to move toward a positive solution? Is there a group that you can engage with and work together with? And then, is there a movement you can join, a larger movement? I think that this collabor collaboration is the, really the most important way forward. And then, one final thing that I want to suggest, in case you're interested, is read um, the actual text of the Green New Deal. So not just like a news article about it, but actually go online and Google Green New Deal PDF and you'll find it and read the text of House Resolution 109, the Green New Deal. It's 14 pages long, but it's got like three inch margins and it's double spaced. So it'll take you about 10 minutes to read it. And I, I don't, I'm not making a political plug or advocating one way or another, but I think it's really one of the most brilliant um, outlines of how to move forward on um, solving the climate crisis or at least moving toward that in a way that is going to benefit everyone and be fair and equitable and solve many of our problems along with the climate crisis. So um, I think that's it, unless you have any questions. Are you president? <laughs> <laughs> no.
I get to ask one question first. So, um, that last one about policy, do you have any local level city governments that are using Drawdown as a guide for shaping their climate policies? We do. Um, so I think the best, that, and there's, there's many that are happening, so I'm not up to date on all of them because uh, many of them are just now looking at it and using Drawdown as a framework, but one that has actually done so is the city of um, Cincinnati. And they, they used Drawdown um, as a model, so from beginning to end. So they um, looked at as many sectors of solutions as possible that they could implement in their city. And they did this as part of their um, climate action plan. So in um, 2017, it was time for them to do a revision of their climate action plan. And when they revised it, they did it with a drawdown framework. So they, they actually held meetings in every um, neighborhood in the city and solicited suggestions. And they narrowed those down um, in terms of like, what was feasible, which is the same analysis that Project Drawdown does. Because none of the solutions that are included in Drawdown all of them are feasible. They're already proven to be feasible. And um, they are all already proven to have multiple benefits besides the climate benefits. So they're all solutions that we should be implementing whether or not there were a climate crisis. And so Cincinnati took that, um, that view. And they engaged with all different um, constituencies, so citizens, businesses, academics, um, and they really did a very broad collaborative effort to develop their climate plan. So I think that's the best um, example. You could read about it if you, um, if you Google it, you can find exactly what they did. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's the best example. Follow up to that. Mm -hmm. The model that Drawdowns used and has continued to use, did Cincinnati use that model and shape it for their own? They did not use our exact models of the solutions like uh, but they um but they did an analysis of their emissions so that they can using a um a software program that's developed by ICLE, which is an organization that cities around the country work with and they have a um a um emissions counting tool and so they did use that so that um, actually measuring their emissions is part of their plan so that they can measure where they started and their progress. Um, the city of Santa Rosa, I was at a meeting yesterday and I don't know that they're going to be, or that they're using it currently, but the book uh, Drawdown is on their radar screen. One of the city, um, city councilors mentioned the book during, during the meeting. Great. So it's good to know that that this group, the uh, Santa Rosa Climate Action Subcommittee, is at least you know looking at it. That's wonderful to hear. <laughs> um, yes, in the back. You mentioned oceans, and uh, I only see tidal uh, energy is, is included in the original set. What's yeah. new? Well, that is um, that. Um, the result of that analysis won't be released until early next year. So I'll say stay tuned. Mm -hmm. but, we have, but we're looking, we brought on um, ocean specialists who are looking at a full suite of ocean solutions. So stay tuned for that. Yes? I understand the uh, need for educating girls and young women, but um, I noticed gender equity was one of the um, categories, and I, won't, I just find patriarchy so repulsive, but so viciously self-defending. Can you say more about what gender equity, how it fits in? Sure. So we have three of the solutions. So also on your comment on patriarchy, so that was one of like the, the elements of the really comprehensive plan that we might <laughs> consider <laughs> how to make the patriarchy less toxic, but I digress. <laughs> uh, so we have three solutions that we consider to be under this category of gender equity, which are educating girls, family planning, and then women smallholders. 
So equal um, access to resources for women smallholder farmers. Um, educating, when girls are educated, studies have proven that they tend to um, have more decision um, agency over when to start their families and their family sizes. And the same with um, family planning. So family planning in our analysis refers to giving the women who, um, I think it's 130 million women worldwide who have expressed a desire to have access to family planning, giving them that access. And these, um, how this work, how this fits into our modeling of emissions analysis is that um, we look at whether we, whether we as a human family will reach the UN's um, high projection of population or median projection. So we, uh, we um, estimate that if educating, if sufficient resources are devoted to educating girls worldwide and to family planning, then we can limit the growth of the human population to the UN median um, level. And, and that will in turn mean that we use fewer resources and those are, it's fewer um, carbon footprints. Just a note, uh, if you take all of the, if you take the educating girls and family planning and all of those gender equity things together, mm -hmm. it actually is very close to the top solution. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? Right? <laughs> Um, okay, so there are a number of solutions that address um, forests um, and um, forest protection, forest restoration, afforestation. So all of those have specific definitions in our in our research and analysis. So what I want I want to refer because I'm not the expert in those areas. I want to refer you to Drawdown.org where you could look at that analysis specifically if you're interested. Well, I'm I'm wondering if some of our groups should start logging in Sacramento that they're being held clear cutting in California. I'm excited that I have spurred you to start thinking about something. <laughs> and that, you know, this might be one of the things that you and who, whatever group you work with will analyze and decide on. And it's, it's, it's a perfect example of what I'm saying is that um, we created this work, but we really mean it to be taken up worldwide, and we don't know what's best in every locality. That's for the experts in that locality to determine. So it's your perfect. Your question's a perfect example. I think there was someone. Yes. Yeah. Educating girls is so important. Mm -hmm. What about educating boys? <laughs> <laughs> yes, equally important. But um, as I said earlier, so our, as, part, as part of the boundaries around this research project, we had to look at what, where is the existing data? Where is the existing research and data? So that's what our analysis has focused on. So there's endless um, opportunities to take this research further um, you, and to 
analyze different aspects of it. Um, there's so many more questions that are raised by it, and we really mean it for it to be a starting point. So, but your point's very well taken. I'll just add to that. We hosted a group of teachers just prior to this, this evening, teaching climate change in their classrooms. So that's basically the goal is to empower students to be part of the solution. And so that's just getting started. I mean, here locally, there's bits and pieces happening, but more to come. You want to add to that? Yeah, speaking of students being part of the solution, hi everyone, I'm Annabelle, I'm a local student, and I wanted to take advantage of this opportunity having you all who are willing to show up and show that you care about the climate to tell you about a climate strike that's happening where there's like an international climate strike in September 20th, and um, so the plan is to meet in the morning at the JC, march to the courthouse square, and um, there's going to be a rally in tons of environmental Okay, so awesome stuff, and probably a lot of you have other events you want to share, right? No? No. But um, I want to know is there a curriculum already developed by this? Oh, Crystal. Oh. Um, there is not. How okay. there is not. And we actually, I mean, it's something that we see a huge need for and a huge demand for. So, but we, we're not in a position to develop a curriculum. So um, what we're doing at this point is just focusing on teachers who have already used, are already developed, have already incorporated this work into their teaching. So at every level, every level of education, um, K through 12 through university. And, um, and the idea is to, I'm actually about to launch a network where they will be able to share um, what they've already produced so that other teachers can learn about it. Um, they can share it. Teachers who want to find out how to do it can see it. And um, so that is going to get off the ground later this month. I uh, just, just using your eco challenge. Yes, yeah, so the, the eco challenge has been it's used in right classrooms now. all yeah. around the country yeah. and actually other parts of the world as well. Uh, I'll just add to that the top California team was a school that I worked with in Southern California that used the Eco Challenge. So it's a great tool. And then this this evening, the teacher that shared about how she used uh, is integrating climate change in her sixth grade class mm -hmm. from Kenwood School uh, used Drawdown as sort of the students analyze one of the top ten solutions and then mm -hmm. crafted a solution that they presented to their school board that got adopted wow. and implemented is now being implemented at their school. So that's just an example of how it's not that hard to take drawdown and turn it into a lesson. Yeah. I'm but. not a teacher, so I won't yeah. speak to that, but I do hear weekly from teachers who are telling us that they are using it in their classrooms. You have an education um, I question? I just to say about the September 20th. I'm also a teacher in Tetaluma, and um, at our school, um, we have been discussing supporting students who will walk out, and I know that there's walkouts happening um, throughout the county, so um, anybody who knows who wants to support that, teach we can always use adult help <laughs> when you're doing a walkout. Mm -hmm. You want to contact your local school mm -hmm. see if they're doing anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, it seems to me that adults who aren't in a formal education setting, one of the, the ways that people are um, enjoying themselves and educating themselves are book clubs. And I'm wondering if any, um, I noticed that the company that you talked about, they kind of formed a book club inside. I wondered if you had any tools. It's often good to have tools for book clubs to help them. This is a lot of information. And so with uh, some recommended approaches. We, we are actually are developing some. So some will have, not specifically for book clubs, but are, but some materials that summarize the work and um, simplify it that we will be, that should be ready um, in October. And I hear from 
book clubs and community groups constantly who are using the work. And um, there's an organi organization, Pachamama Alliance, that has created a, a, their own curriculum about to introduce Drawdown. And they have reached hundreds and hundreds of people around the U.S. with that, with that, with their introduction to Drawdown. I'll just add on the book club, the Sebastopol Library has been really great at introducing uh, relevant topics. The book club I participated there recently was Climate Justice was a title. Uh, and they'll probably pick up Drawdown as well. Um, so Sebastopol community and your local libraries where if you're not from Sebastopol. I will um, mention at this juncture, there's a local group here in Sebastopol that, that formed um, just a few months ago called Sebastopol Climate Action. And Steve is uh, leading that regard and some of us are a part of that. The idea of passing um, a climate emergency resolution here in the city and then, you know, what do we do? What are we some, taking some proactive steps? So if you, we were sort of passing around signups, if you want to be, learn more about that, um, do you want to pass that around, Steve, I guess? It's circulating now. It's circulating now. So that's what that's about. That's a local Sebastopol thing. And, and it's happening also in other communities. I, would, so. I just want to make a point. So just along the line of all these questions is that we, and this is something that we believe at Project Drawdown, that the era of the hero is over. So if you're looking for one person or one organization such as Project Drawdown to tell you how are we going to do this, then no, <laughs> we refuse to tell you <laughs> because that, you know, that era of the hero is over and we have to use the mass creativity that's out there around the world. Someone in this room has much better ideas than we have even heard of yet. <laughs> Go forth and yeah. create with our, what we've given you. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then, oh. then you. <laughs> okay. um, I just was part of a Sunrise uh, Zoom call, mm -hmm. and what they're talking, one of the things that comes out, oh, and I did a blog on it, which I sent you, but one of the things that comes out loud and strong is we need absolutely everyone. Like Sunrise is focused on 30 and under. One goal is to have a hub in every high school in the United States. Mm -hmm. Each each kid gets out there and gets 10 kids, and one of them gets another 10 kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going to take a lot of work, but the focus is to get the Green New Deal, to make it happen. And in order to do that, it will take flipping the Senate which means going back into electoral politics. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of work to be done there. If you have any you know, desire to do it, uh, one thing you can do is be in touch with Sunrise. I want to know who the hub kids are so we can, you know, do you need a ride to wherever you're going or how can I help you? Yeah, and don't forget to tell the young people about solutions. <laughs> exactly. Don't want them getting burnt out and depressed, which they are getting now because they're so focused on the problem. We have to help them understand that there's solutions. Yes, sir. The uh, National Resource Defense Council has come up with a lot of um, innovations. They, they actually uh, help California write all the emission standards for buildings, cars, and so on. Have you worked with them at all? They're right here in San Francisco. Um, we are not. Um, we're not, I uh, don't think so, no. I don't think anyone on our team is working specifically with them. Excuse me, there's a fly. <laughs> there's several. They're, they're, um, they're working actively with governments all over the world, like with India and China, to get them to change their policies. So they're working very heavily in a political sphere. That's great. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes sir. Um, tagging on to what Tor brought up earlier about the climate emergency resolution. Um, it seems to be a really big focus right now, and it's, it's gone countywide, trying to give po politicians that push to declare the climate emergency that we're living in. And so there are a couple of us here who have petitions. If you are interested in learning about the climate emergency resolution and, and helping give them the boost that they need, we've got the petitions if you're interested in signing. We'll do that after the, the session here. But don't forget to let them know 
to focus on the solutions. Right. <laughs> because, um, and I'm actually a former elected official from Maryland, and mm -hmm. I know from experience that we really want to have positive things to show, you know, and we really want to work on positive things that benefit the constituents. So it's, not, it's really not enough to get the um, elected officials to say, yes, this is a big problem if that's as far as it goes. In fact, um, and no, with no offense to the climate emergency movement, but I really think we can skip over the part where they acknowledge <laughs> that there's um, a climate crisis and just get to work on solutions. That's my personal opinion. <laughs> so, yes. can I, I just want to say one thing about that. Um, so we're so, sort of fighting for the, um, the uh, net emissions to be within like 2030, and so we're kind of fighting against the other climate emergency resolution that the cities are looking at that are saying 2050. So that's what this is about. It's like no <coughs> sooner. You know, you know, science is saying much sooner than 2050. So. Yeah, and that, you know, that's actually, although it is like a, a somewhat of a depressing thing, it's also an encouraging thing. So when Project Drawdown started in 2015, we were looking at a 30 year time span as well. And it wasn't until like last year that there was so much movement for no faster, faster. So it's great, you know, it's great that there's there's been this momentum. So there there's something positive to point to, I think. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, really appreciate the focus on solutions and you know energizing all of us. Um, the uh, issue that the, you talked about at the beginning of how this gets played out in the media and what a lot of people think is happening, I'd like to get your kind of your perspective on that's, you know, it's really about fossil fuels mm -hmm. and we need to do something to change the incentive system for how we uh, use um, fossil fuels in our transportation and energy generation. And I know in your Book, you say, well, we're not really addressing the issue of a carbon tax or whatever other economic mechanism. But what should we as citizens be advocating from our elected uh, representatives, particularly at the federal level? Well, I mean, I, I can't say that for certain, but a carbon tax is a good thing to advocate for. I mean, we, we don't say that there shouldn't be a, a carbon tax, but one of the assumptions of our research project, because we had to put boundaries around it, is that the needed policies would be in effect. So we actually need a lot of work on getting policies into place that will support drawdown solutions. And in our, our analysis, um, so our most, um, actually our drawdown analysis and our even more optimistic analysis actually relies on a complete transition to renewable energy. So although we, we do emphasize that um, energy so solutions are not the only solutions, it's still really essential that we make that transition. Crystal? So we're missing the climate town hall, I guess, tonight? One of them? I think it's recorded somewhere. What have you gleaned from? Any wisdom to share from the policies that are being? I, I confess I have not analyzed um, the candidates' policies, so okay. I, I really can't comment on that. <laughs> yes, sir. I work with uh, <clears throat> Hispanic students and uh, also with a particular Hispanic family mm -hmm. and uh, many of them are new immigrants and uh, I'm just struck that, that I was hoped that this information could somehow be disseminated into the Hispanic community because it's 30% of this county and uh, I'm, I'm how can that be done? I mean, part of the problem is that the level of education of the parents in the first place is very low. And they, they aren't watching the news, they aren't, uh, they don't know much about it. And, but the students, once they go to public school, well, if they've got good teachers, they can be taught.
taught and their minds can be open, so that's where there's a, a good opening, but how to really reach them. I mean, I have a hard time just even teaching math, much less climate change, but that would be excellent. I, I agree with you, that would be excellent. And, <laughs> and I wish we could do all of these things. Um, I have been working on, uh, with the Hispanic Radio Network, we're trying to get funding to do a series on the Hispanic Radio Network that would actually go toward what you're saying, but we're stuck at the funding phase. <laughs> so, um, um, so I, but I agree with you. <laughs> um, uh, education, politics, government, policy, all that. Uh, you, all of the industries I saw up there were businesses. Uh, what are people doing to reach into the business community? Um, we, uh, there, there are quite a few businesses who have taken up this work. So I can't, um, I'm limited on what I can say. Um, you know, as far as what I know about, about some of them, but um, some have been very, have been open about what they're doing as, and their influence with Drawdown, like the com company Intuit. Um, they had, had um, you know, their employees read the book. Because of Drawdown, they took on a project to address refrigerants in, um, I don't remember what company, um, country, possibly Nigeria. And so they set up a project to collect old um, air conditioning units, et cetera, and to um, properly dispose of, the, um, of those gases. So, I mean, that's one example, and I know that they are looking to expand what they're doing um, with Drawdown as an influence, and that's one example. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's, like, I think that's one area of action, is to go to your employer and say, this is what's important to us, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, and I think that's, I think that's really going to start happening more because the younger people and younger employees want to have workplaces where they, that they can feel engaged, you know, that they can feel um, are, is in alignment with their values. So, uh, uh, in fact, we often get inquiries from people. You know, I want to quit my job and work full time for climate. And I always say, we really need you to stay where you are <laughs> and influence your workplace in your company. So. Great. Thank you. Okay. Maybe two more. Should we keep going? Okay. Two more. Alright, in the back of the straights. <laughs> I'm hungry for rethinking government. I'm hungry for the first part where everyone is implicitly, well, I like saying that round is chosen for the shape of the earth because when it's round, everyone sits at the head of the table. And there is something about how are becoming acclimated to delegating, delegating authority, delegating responsibility. And, and that whole dynamic needs to be reversed. Rethinking responsibility. Rethinking who we are. Um, I'm telling you for a good part of it. Anyone, anyone want to sit, sit with me and think about that? I've got some ideas. Sounds good. <laughs> and did you have a question? Yes. Um, have you seen or noticed any work that is having an impact to halting the destruction of the rainforest? Mm, um. <coughs> Anything in particular? <coughs> or just worldwide climate? Yeah, I don't know if I see. I, I, there is a, um, there is an organization, and I, but now, um, it's escaping my mind the name of it. Ran Rainforest. Action yeah, Network. I think it's, but I think it's, yeah, Rainforest Action Network. 
And um, they're, in fact, they are going to be, I think, at the um, New York climate strike, they're going to have something projected onto buildings to bring attention to the issue. But I, but I don't know specifically um, like what is being successful there. One more question. <laughs> if we were having this presidential debate here tonight, what one question would you want to ask candidates? Uh. <laughs> oh, wow, that's a good that's question. A good question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it would be one um, question. I mean, I would be listening for certain things. So I would be listening for um, whether they are considering a broad range of solutions. And I also would want to be hearing whether they are going to, whether they're addressing the things that can only happen on the federal and nation state level. Like the refrigerant, refrigerants issue is really important. So I'd be listening for that. Um, and I'd be listening for um, Green New Deal. Now that's me personally saying that. But I'd, I'd want to hear if there was some understanding of it. And if and I wanted, I would want to know if candidates are really serious about the just transition. The, so the just transition. Yeah. Yes, a just transition. So as we move toward. Um, sustainability and solutions, are we doing it in a way that's fair? Are we doing it in a way that's going to um, address health issues that's not going to damage certain communities, that's not going to leave behind certain communities? Are we doing it in a way that's going to actually improve our society and address multiple other problems, societal problems at the same time? So.